I'd like to do, I'm Marsha Connor, Executive Director of um, NFBPA. The future of policing is our theme for our conference for the public policy discussion. Um, this is an outgrowth of not only what we've seen nationally, but also our public policy committee um, has um, worked on resolutions, uh, preparing white papers around the um, issues of uh, public safety and reimagining it. So I'd like to introduce our co-chairs uh, for uh, today, our uh, moderators really for today. Uh, Senator Royce West was first elected to the Texas Senate in November of 1992. Since taken office, he has represented the 23rd Senatorial District on behalf of the citizens of Dallas County and Texas Legislature. During his tenure, he has been uh, named by Texas Monthly as one of the 24, 25 most powerful people in Texas politics politics. He's been selected for the magazine's by, you know, 10 best legislators in Texas list and has twice been named as the honorable mention. Some of the legislation and key initiatives that he's been involved in was the creation of college admission opportunities for all students, including the establishment of the University of North Texas at Dallas and a new law school in downtown Dallas. His legislation in Texas Juvenile Crime Prevention Center at Prairie View um, A&M University He's increased funding for at-risk youth um, programs. He's also enhanced enforcement of protective orders and instituted more efficient uses of criminal justice resources through legislation. He has passed um, many, many uh, legislative items. Um, he is no stranger to uh, police reform, has no negotiated, I understand, if you um, been on the other side of negotiating some contracts um, for police, and he is going to be an outstanding moderator and look forward to what he brings to the discussion today. co we'll moderating with um, uh, Senator West is the Honorable Stephanie Rawlings-Blake. Um, she is a native of Baltimore, Maryland. I if I could ask you to pause for just one moment, Marcia, I'm just going to make sure all the attendees are muted because we have a little bit of feedback and then Marcia, you can unmute yourself to continue. Thank you so much. Please continue, Marcia. Okay, um, Cole, we have um, moderator, the Honorable Stephanie Rollins-Blake. She is a native of Baltimore, Maryland. She received her political science degree from Oberlin College in Oberlin, Ohio, and a JD degree from the University of Maryland School of Law, Baltimore, Maryland. She has served on the Baltimore City Democratic State Central Committee and as a member of the Young Democrats of Maryland. 1995, she was the youngest person ever elected to the Baltimore City Council at the age of 25. She went on to serve as the president of the council and uh, she was elected president in 2007 and 2010 when the mayor, the then mayor, Sheila Dixon resigned. The following year, Rollins Blake was elected mayor of Baltimore. In 2013, she became the secretary of the Democratic National Committee. And in 2015, she was elected president of the U.S. Conference of Mayors. In 2016, Rollins Blake stepped down as mayor from Baltimore and founded SRB and Associates a government relations firm. And in 2017, she became a senior advisor of Denton's, a multinational law firm. She has received a number of um, awards, including the NFBPA 2012 National Leadership Award in Public Service. We um, welcome our two moderators. And I don't know if you were able to hear the information regarding Senator West. Are you? I was able to hear it. Okay. All right. So I have this opportunity to turn this over to the two of you. Madam Mayor, nice seeing okay. you again. It's and, good to see and to hear you. Well, I tell you what, I look forward to this panel discussion because, frankly, we have some great experts here that can kind of give each other some great tips in terms of best practices uh, that they may very well want to implement within their specific city, county, or whatever governmental entity they work for. So uh, do you want to start off with the uh, questions? I do. Um, I'm very happy to start with the questions. I didn't know if uh, Marsha was going to introduce the panel as well, or if they wanted to run through and do a quick introduction Great. themselves. What, what do you, what I is your pleasure? I think that they can do a quick introduction of themselves. Got it. Can we start with Mr. Smith? Yes, thank you, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Anthony Smith, 
the executive director of Cities United, a national organization supporting mayors and local leaders as they create safe, healthy, and hopeful communities for young Black men and boys, uh, focused on reducing the homicide rate of young Black men and boys 14 to 24 uh, by 50 percent by the year 2025. Excited to be a part of this conversation and look forward to the questions. Perfect. Ms. Mason? Good afternoon. My name is Carol Mason. I'm the president of John Jay College of Criminal Justice, which is a 15,000 liberal arts college in the city of New York, um, but it was founded as a police college and now we are proudly fierce advocates for justice and with Noble we are leading a conversation about the future of public safety in our community. So we look forward to this discussion and learning more today. Thank you so much. Chief Kelly? Hello, my name is Melron Kelly. I'm the Deputy Chief of Police in Columbia, South Carolina. I'm also an advisory board member of Cities United and a proud member of Noble. I welcome this conversation and good to see a lot of familiar faces. Thank you. Mayor Tubbs? Good afternoon, my name is Michael Tubbs. I'm the mayor of the city of Stockton, California. That, that's your only intro, sir? That's, that's, all you wanted, that's all you want to tell us about yourself? You're a new dad? Every, I, I assume everyone here is a son or daughter or father and mother or both. So I'm a new dad. My son, my son turns one in two weeks. And as you can see, I am still Stephanie Rawlings Blake's intern, although I've never worked for her or interned for her. She doesn't seem to know that still. I'm just so proud of you. <laughs> just so proud. All right, Mr. Crawford. It's Larry one Dwayne Crawford, the director for the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives Noble. Also being greetings on behalf of our national president, Linda Williams. And part of our mission is to ensure equity and administration of justice. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much. And I think our last panelist is Mr. Cole. Um, hi there, everyone. Uh, my name is Terrell Cole, the Deputy Chief of Operations for the City of Cleveland, but uh, I am a uh, participant and member of the Policy Committee for uh, NFBPA uh, nationally, and it's my pleasure to, to, to join you today. That's great. I would like Hi. to interrupt that the uh, video is ready if you'd like to play it, and then Stephanie, you and uh, Senator Rest, would you like to move in after that? Sounds that, great. That's great. Thank you so much for that video and I'm excited to jump right into the question. And um, I will take the answer in any order uh, that you'd like to start. Um, considering you're viewing, we're viewing the state of public safety and policing as if it were a triage, I'm curious what the top three public safety issues that you believe are facing um, public administrators, mayors, uh, chiefs across the country. Stephanie, may I, let me make a suggestion. Because of the time factor, can we get mm -hmm. maybe two, three persons respond and kind of move through the questions and then hopefully have opportunity at the end to just have a general discussion? That works for me. Okay. Top three public safety issues. Chief Kelly? Um, I would first say definitely public trust. There's a, a lack thereof. Uh, also, substantive violence reduction initiatives that include the community's point of view and opinion. 
And thirdly, uh, just a general understanding of what public safety is. Public safety is not just policing. Public safety is a myriad of things that to include community voice, politicians, elected officials as well. Um, just the, the collective voice of the people who are being not only policed, by serve, but served by, by the people. Thank you. Mayor Tubbs? Yeah, yeah, I would definitely echo the chief in terms of public trust. Um, and then just to build on what you said in your second point, chief, it's really understanding that police in and of themselves are necessary, not sufficient to bring about the outcomes for safety. So figuring out how we create the public will and also find the public resources to put all the inputs we know communities need to be safe. Inputs like good schools, input like opportunities to job, inputs like transportation infrastructure, et cetera. Um, and, and then number three, I think it's also um, on the issue of mental health and crisis response and how do we sort of, again, not just train our police officers, but train our community not to use 911 and the dispatch officer as our only response to mental health or our primary response to things that don't actually require a law enforcement presence, but also making sure we have the resources and a real plan to do that. Got it. Um, Mr. Smith, or Ms. Mr. Smith. I just want to add, I think uh, what the mayor and the deputy chief said are right on, but I do think we've got to reckon with the history of policing uh, and that what it was founded on and what it still uh, consists of. So we got to call out the racism the structural racism that exists in policing. If we're truly are going to reimagine policing, uh, our public safety in a new way, we've got to have that conversation too. So I would add that to the mix, but I think everything else was right on point. But I don't want us to forget that policing was founded uh, as a racist uh, practice and continues to be that way. Thank you so much. I'll turn it over to Senator Royce, Senator West, sorry. You have to unmute, Senator. Okay, there we go. I'm going to go right back to Chief Kelly because I think that you can give us this perspective. You know, in 2019, there was about 236 officers who lost their lives to suicide. Yes. And in 2020, there have been so far 136 that have been identified. What can we do in order to uh, support the mental health and well-being of officers given the amount of stress that they experience on and off the job? Uh, it initially starts with hiring. We have to have a really robust uh, hiring system that evaluates a person's fitness for duty to begin with so that we can avoid them coming into the job with, with certain factors that uh, would in, inhibit their ability. But as we progress through the career, just keeping a, a, a good eye out and a good system um, for officers that experience trauma, uh, but whether that be in the job uh, on a scene or just through the course of their career and, and not being afraid to have someone leave the organization for the good of their own mental health, uh, but being readily available to recognize those triggering factors of, of suicide because sometimes it manifests itself of them exhibiting those behaviors on other people and we wanna avoid that at all costs, but just the early warning signs and being able, able to uh, recognize that is key. Okay, Mr. Crawford, what, 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 how would you respond to that? I agree with the Chief. I would just only just add that we also define how can we get assistance, independent assistance for these men and women that are really our heroes out there and serving our communities from a law enforcement standpoint. So we don't want to be punitive. So the ability to be able to get to a hotline or some level of care that is somewhat independent, and you got to keep in mind there are approximately 18,000 agencies. So, you know, if there's a way to do it from a national standpoint, but I would definitely look at independent care in a way that people feel comfortable asking for help and not feeling as though it'll be a punitive process as they get that assistance. I mean, is, is that infrastructure not currently in place? Is not on a national level. Now, the good news is that, and, and people may not know this, more suicide within law enforcement occur than actual women that are killed in the line of duty. The good news in the last few years is becoming really a national call to action, and especially the federal level. But to the best of my knowledge, there really isn't a national structure in place where people can get that kind of care and assistance. Now, there are agencies that provide that, but whatever we do, we gotta make it not a stigma to ask for help and have it somewhat independent where it isn't so necessarily punitive. But again, I'll defer to Chief Kelly because I'm sure from an operational standpoint, he has a lot more expertise, but we gotta find a way to get that assistance there 
and probably have it very similar to other a profession where somebody independent and how they get their care. You're very good. Uh, we have a city administrator here, and I know that the city administrators have had to deal with this particular issue. So, Mr. Cole, I'll ask you what, is, what has been your experience there in Cleveland? Well, in Cleveland, um, uh, most of you may or may not know that we have um, a consent decree uh, ourselves. And so we have transformed um, many aspects of uh, our recruitment uh, strategies, um, not just on the recruitment, the, the hiring practices, including uh, some behavioral, uh, you, know, um, you know, assessments as far as hiring officers. Um, but also including uh, technology. So, uh, you know, the review and uh, of performance, uh, all these things are able to be taken into consideration, um, not just for the sense of serving the community, but also serving the officers as well. Um, it, even in terms of the support systems that we, that we do have in place, um, that's taken into account uh, as well. Um, and, and really, I think one of the, the, the biggest shifts that we've had is in terms of uh, being purposeful and, and how we address community policing. Um, we received a lot of recognition in terms of how we address the Republican National Convention. So we, we did not have these aggressive paramilitary type approaches. Um, and so those kinds of innovations are uh, crucial for uh, engaging community and also sending the right message to officers that we're there to engage and serve the community even in the most uh, tense times. Um, I'd like to say that we were 100% uh, all the time on that. I think um, with some of the protests that we uh, experienced in, in Cleveland, it may not have um, been our uh, you know, best uh, 100%, but I think we addressed it. Um, and uh, you know, we are, uh, when we had the um, convention uh, here, or at least the debates here, um, those improvements from the protests were, were readily seen uh, and present. Uh, uh, Dr. Mason, Carol, let me, let me ask you this question. You know, we look at it, I want to look at it from the perspective of the police officer at this point. There'll be other questions needless to say. But we have police departments that are more diverse now. That's something we've been fighting for over the years. We're seeing more and more African Americans become police officers. Um, how have police officers been impacted by our current state of social unrest? Is there any type of quantitative analysis that's been done on that or any analysis whatsoever? So I'm going to start by saying I'm a lawyer, I'm not a, a doctor, a PhD, and I'm the president of a police college, and, but I want to answer your question this way. I think that what we do know is that, it, that, that if you have people from the community um, in policing, you have better results, and by in the community, I mean that you've got to be partners with the community, part of the community. And while this conversation is focused on reimagining policing, you can't do that without asking the question and thinking about the question of reimagining public safety. Because as every, we've been leading a series of conversations with Noble over the last um, month and a half, and one thing that is commonly said by everybody, whether they're police officers, line officers, community members, advocates, is that we've got to think about how do we invest in our community so that they're healthier, so that police aren't called in to do the things that police shouldn't be doing. And so we were asking police because of the 911 system, they are the, the first responders for any kind of crisis when people are in crises. And they are not naturally the people who are equipped and prepared to respond, which I think adds to the mental health impacts of both sides of the equation, the community and the officers. So if we could, I, I, I was excited about participating in this panel because we're talking to the people public administrators who make the decisions about where investments are made. And I want, and I hope that you all will hear as career professionals um, versus the politicians, no disrespect for the politicians, but you're the ones that here are, we are, hope are here for longevity and not during, not four year terms, eight year terms. This work is gonna take decades to do and we need consistency. And, and I want this audience to understand that, that you all have the power to decide how we invest in safer communities, which then allow police to do the jobs we really want them to do, which is deal with real true violent crime, not be social workers, mental health providers, um, school um, resource officers, but focus on the real issues that communities need um, from police. Let me, let me get one more response on this question. Uh, Mr. Smith, Anthony? Yeah, thank you for that. And I think, uh... I cannot say it any better than what Carl Mason just said. 
is that we really got to get to a place where we've identified where we need police uh, and that will show up different city by city, right? And I think we got to be real clear about that. But we also got to reimagine and redefine what public safety is. Uh, and that can be across the country and across the nation. Because again, as you heard Deputy Chief Melron said, public safety and the mayor, uh, Mayor Tubbs talked about public safety really deals with making sure that families have affordable, safe housing, parents have access to quality, uh, high paying jobs, that kids go to good schools that keep them in and not push them out, uh, that we have access to healthcare, the both mental and physical. And, uh, and then uh, also to the point where uh, uh, Carol Mason talked about is that those who protect and serve need to be in proximity with those who they protect and serve. We should not have police officers living in other counties coming into a city to police it when they don't know those folks and they're actually scared of those folks. So it goes back to those things. So right, if we can reimagine, redefine, and I think we've got to be super creative because we're asking for a world that we've never seen. Uh, and black and brown folks have been pushing for this for a long time, which is why here in Louisville, Kentucky, we've seen over 155 days of protests to say, we still have not got justice for Brianna, but it's not just about that. It's also saying we gotta have some common sense laws. Why would you have a no knock warrant law in a city that's in a stand your ground state? So you bust through my door, I have a right to stand my ground. I shoot at you all and then all of y'all tear up the joint and don't even know who you're shooting at. So it just makes no sense. So we gotta be real clear around not just practices, but what the policies look like, and then how they're implemented, and then how we hold people accountable. So this reimagining public safety is where we got to get ourselves to. And we just got to be clear that it's not around law enforcement, jails, and detention centers. It's actually around the things that we know that keeps our family safe, healthy, and hopeful. Stephanie? Uh, definitely. I um, agree with uh, your your observation, Mr. Smith, about having officers live in the communities they serve. When I was mayor, I, I put together a, a, a housing incentive program. And the first thing I did was to create incentives for uh, first responders, fire and police to live in the neighborhoods that uh, they served. And, and was pleased when, uh, when it happened because it, it, it is, um, it's community building all around. So I definitely agree with that uh, point. So beyond training, um, which we know is essential, what is being done or what can be done to intentionally combat police brutality and racial uh, bias against black and brown people? And I'd like to start uh, with President Mason. Oh, thank you for starting with me. I was gonna ask if I could start. So I, I think that what we gotta do is change the culture of policing and change who we're bringing into policing and how we bring them into policing. So through this series of co six conversations, we, we, uh, uh, the, um, Mr. Cole from Cleveland talked about tactics and things. So I think that we, one of the things we have to stop doing is taking people through an academy in a military style training because then they're, you're inculcating them in a mentality of they're, they're thinking about they're going to war. Stop using words like a war on crime, a war, you know, and start using different terminology because words matter. So I think you've got to think about who you're recruiting in and then what job you're preparing them to do and then and equipping them to do that job. So at John Jay, which is educating um, a predominantly black and brown um, men and women to go into law enforcement, I am focused on making sure they have cultural competency when they go out into law enforcement so that they understand the communities and understand that they're supposed to be partners with the community and part of the community so we don't have this us versus them kind of thinking. They all ought to be thinking about how do we partner together, how do we work together collaboratively um, to make sure our communities are safe. And again, I've got to go back to the other, my other mantra, we've got to make investments in our communities, in our people, so that we don't have the crises where they, there is behavior that becomes criminalized. Great, I'd like to go to Mr. Crawford. I echo uh, what, what Carol just said. He heard us talk about culture. We can have all the national and local and state guidelines and policies that we want to implement. But as people always say, culture eats what? 
policy for lunch. And I think we sometimes don't want to deal with that elephant in the room. I mean, everything that's being said, whether it be how we, the people we're looking for, we're looking for guardians, not warriors. We're looking for people as best we can to have what those soft skills. For example, we're looking for people that can really address the social service need. We're not looking for those, I'm not knocking those from the military, but that a ramble that we're looking for. We're looking for people that can really serve that community and reflect that community. And last thing I'll say is this, we sometimes keep other partners out of these conversations. We need to also involve the private sector. I'm, I'm probably spending just as much time now doing with informing CEOs and executives and employees of the role that they can play. Let's keep this in mind from an a, 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 a administrative standpoint, that's probably your largest tax base, supposed to be your largest tax base. So to also say, making sure that we look at the community needs, making sure that silent group, sometimes which is the private sector, is being brought to the table also because their employees are living and working in what? These same communities. Thank you so much. As a follow-up to that question, I want to ask the chief and, and um, the mayor, you know, what are the barriers that are, are faced when you try to do um, innovative strategies to com combat police brutality and uh, racial mm -hmm. bias? Um, again, going back to what Ms. Mason said and Dwayne as well, culture, the cultural kill strategy, we know that. But I think being bold enough as a leader, as a may mayor or police chief, to just step out of the frame of, of you know, the culture of policing uh, to do some bold things. Um, I'm a, I lived in a community where I policed. I was incentivized by doing that. Those things work. And I think Mayor Tubbs can tell you just the way he did things in Stockton with the uh, universal income. You have to be willing to do things that have never been thought of but also bringing the people to the table who are being policed. I think there's a certain level of hubris in policing that we think that we know what's best for the community. That model does not work. It gets people hurt and uh, it's not the way to go. We're changing the dynamic in that. Uh, I think bringing the people to the table and, and find out what it is that they think that policing should be in their community uh, is, is the way to go. We can't just pop into a neighborhood and police people, not knowing the culture and the dynamics and the norms of the neighborhood, we're, we're asking for trouble when we do that, especially when we have no ties to the area. So being a part of the community that we serve and, and for the city managers and mayors out there listening, it works. Incentivize officers and first responders who can move into the area and be bold enough to tick off as many people uh, as you can doing the non-traditional things that you know will work in your community. Thank you. Yeah, and, and if, if I may, I'm, I'm going to answer the question, but do a little bit of bragging about the great work uh, my police chief and, and my city manager have, have been engaged in the past several years. Because I think part of it is that it definitely starts with leadership. And I'm blessed in Stockton to have the alignment between kind of the city bureaucracy, the political office, and the police department that are focused on sort of ending white supremacy. And very, saying that very explicitly in how we message. So one of the things we've done is a series of courageous conversations since 2013, where the police chief has met with every family who has ever in the history had an incident of um, use of force by Stockton PD, whether justified or not, and just sitting and listening and hearing the pain of the people and, and, and making amends for when we got it wrong. Um, number two, since 2014, we've been part of the National Trust Initiative. Um, doing deep racial reconciliation work. And to Ms. Mason's point, understanding it's not going to be a four-year, eight-year, this is a 80-year um, experience in terms of building relationship and building trust and having that shared understanding that it's not really a destination, but it's a journey. And that will continue to iterate and continue to have to be in deep and hard conversations. And then the third thing we've done is really focus on sort of alternatives to incarceration when dealing with violent crime. And we've seen a 40% reduction in homicides, a 30% reduction in shootings and get group and gang shootings. And that's continued even during this pandemic. And it's because we've invested in all the other interventions to work alongside law enforcement to give the young men um, who are most likely, and, and Anthony knows this work better than me, um, involved in cycles of crime, um, the opportunity for, for, for a second chance. So, uh, and, and based off all this work, we led the state of California in a decline in officer-involved shootings. And then after the George Floyd protest this year, we decided to do our own kind of consent decree and create a city manager's review board that operates much like a consent decree board would operate and doing the hard work every month 
of sitting down, looking at data, asking questions, and doing so with the community. So we don't have all the answers, but we're deeply committed to this work. But it absolutely starts with leadership in terms of setting a culture of expectation that even if we'll never be perfect, we have to keep progressing. May I just add something? Because I want to make sure that everybody understands that Mayor Tubbs and what he's done in Stockton um, should be looked at and followed because they are one of, when I was at the Department of Justice, um, I created the funding for the National Initiative to Build Community Trust. Stockton was one of our six pilot sites. I got fortunate enough that John Jay was the, the, the recipient of that grant money and so the work is at John Jay, so I've been able to see the continuity in that work. And of the six pilot sites, Stockton is doing it right because it's not just a one and done. It takes constant vigilance, constant work, constant engagement, and on multiple fronts. It's not just educating on implicit bias, racial reconciliation, it, and, and procedural justice. It's also, like he's done, looked at the communities and understanding how to invest in violence interrupters. And so people have got to realize that you've got to do all of these things at once, and you've got to make sure that what you're doing is providing your community with the, the opportunity to succeed. Because, you know, with the had this question is what does a safe community look like where we all want to live that's what a safe community looks like and the question is you know what you want for your community invest that same kind of energy and resources in the communities of people who've been overlooked and and over over policed and under policed at the same time so I, I think that you know look at Stockton I'm so glad when I saw that he was going to be on the panel he's been a speaker of many of our programs because he's doing it right Yes, many are over police and underserved. Um, I will turn it back over uh, to Senator West for the next question. Uh, this is a bit, this is a great discussion, a very a great discussion. Let me let me turn to, um, and I'm going back to Mr. Cole as a, as a city administrator. Um, what innovative ways have you, as an administrator or uh, administrators at your city? have leveraged public-private partnerships in order to find and implement solutions to issues concerning uh, the relationship between police department and our communities? So there's a couple of ways to, to, to answer that. There's, um, particularly for large cities, um, being mindful of the audience that we have cities of all uh, various sizes and, and, and resources. Um, a lot of what you're asking comes down to uh, relationships. So, um, you know, with a large city, oftentimes you have relationships with, uh, you know, federal level, um, you know, support as well as local large uh, companies. And so, you know, we have done those things. But I think some of the largest uh, success we have um, in public-private partnerships is actually uh, on the small neighborhood level. So we have uh, districts. And the relationships in which uh, the district commanders go out into our community really creates the relationships that uh, are necessary to address that neighborhood level um, crime per se. Uh, and we develop uh, programs that help support that. Um, so, uh, you know, when you are looking at, uh, you know, the, the various strategies, it's all really rooted in those relationships and establishing trust. I mean, you know, other than that, you're, you're layering it and how do you expand it? How do you normalize it? But it's, it really is based off of those uh, particular relationships. And so we've doubled down on that. So, um, and, you know, we talk about neighborhood uh, level uh, policing. In Cleveland, we used to have these mini stations and we went away from that. But those concepts were rooted into what we deemed as success in our culture. So we are expanding on those concepts and changing in terms of uh, how we develop or uh, expand that work of community engagement. So it's not just on the police side. We've actually uh, created a cabinet level position. Um, uh, Tracy Martin Thompson, who is in the mayor's office here, is dedicated to uh, violence prevention, innovation, and opportunity strategies. And she is leveraging uh, our rec centers to develop innovative programming uh, out of that space. And that's where a lot of our uh, public-private engagement is coming. It's not directly to the police, it's through that effort, but there's this strong relationship and how we work together. So it's a real systems approach that we're implementing here in, in Cleveland. 
and we're leveraging what people have these traditional strong relationships with the police departments going back to that uh, many, you know, many uh, police station uh, neighborhood level uh, there, but we're also augmenting through the rec centers and, and those programs and leveraging public private dollars to create programs out of that um, employment opportunities for youth and so much more. Uh, Mayor Tubbs, I'm coming right back to you asking you the same question. Um, you, you are the uh, executive or you're the, you're the, the leader of your city. Uh, how have you looked, have you looked and how have you looked at public-private partnerships in order to address relationships between law enforcement and the community? Absolutely. I think, Senator, the biggest sort of um, way we've done that is through one of our violence interrupter programs. So as a city, we have a taxpayer-funded Office of Violence Prevention um, that implements our ceasefire violence deterrent strategy, which is laser-focused on the less than 1% of our population, mostly Black men, who commit 80% of our gun crimes and are oftentimes victims and perpetrators. And we had that strategy, but given Stockton's size and given that the need, I saw a need for another intervention, um, one that would be philanthropically funded. So we we're able to raise some money to bring the Advanced Peace Program to Stockton, which is similar, but it's also sort of data-driven, community-driven, um, look at hiring, the, building the capacity of the community to do some of that violence interruption work as well. And through the partnership between sort of the city funded positions and the community funded positions in our police department, we've been able to do the violence reduction work I mentioned um, in the context of also ongoing work around procedural justice and implicit bias training. Um, so absolutely, especially given this COVID-19 moment where we know cities are, are cash strapped to do the basics. And sadly, this work should be considered the basics and the fundamentals, but we're not as evolved there yet as we, as we should be. So the public-private partnerships are gonna be incredibly important um, to give mayors and city administrators and police chiefs the flexibility to try new things because trying new things sounds good after it's been tried and it's proven to be successful. When you're in the midst of it, you're trying something new, it's actually a little bit scary because if you mess up, it's gonna be off in someone's head. So I think the public-private partnership allows folks to actually try these things that we know that work, but in a way that feels a little bit safer so that then they can make the case to the public about why public dollars should be used for set programs. Thank you. Can I, supplement, wrong? I'm can sorry, I sorry. Oops, yeah. can I just supplement one thing that, that I want to make sure people hear, that when he talked about this program, he talked about assessing and evaluating. And, and I think that is critical when, when you experiment and try new things that you've got to, 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 be, to have the courage to assess it, evaluate it, and pivot if it's not working and tweak it. But you, you can't just invest in things without testing to see whether they work. And can exactly. I also add, Senator, I think to that point, uh, what we've seen in Stockton with Mayor Tubbs is the dream and a vision to say we want to make sure all of our kids can live this way. And what do we need to do that, right? And he's not brought up the universal basic income. That's also an added layer to this. So if you can have a because uh, cities are just that, right? They're incubators. They're places where you experiment and innovate. And you've got to have a leader who's willing to do that and go out on a limb and say, this is why. And so for us, when we come into a city, we work with mayors, we work with other elected officials. Uh, this is where the work happens. But I think also I want to make sure folks heard what uh, Carol Mason said around those who are working inside of city departments, who have those long term, who really influence policy, who really make stuff work, uh, who know where things are buried and how to bury things need to be a part of this conversation. And I think, uh, so I just think all of that is important, but you've got to have good leadership that gets people excited to say, we can try all the things we've been dreaming about uh, in a place where, uh, where we're going to be, it's going to be contained, we're going to pay attention to and come back to it and make the tweaks that we need to make. But I just think, I just wanted to make that point that we've seen Stockton dream in ways that other folks are not dreaming. And you know, before I turn it back over to the mayor, um, social impact bonds. And I don't know how many of you have uh, looked at that particular tool in order to kind of shift the risk, if you will, with Mayor, from um, the city to um, a social service agency that get investors in to go out and do the work that's necessary. So social impact bonds. And I don't know whether um, Mr. Cole in Cleveland or any of the other cities that you've looked at the use of those particular type of bonds in order to get things done, get additional dollars in to deal with some of those social issues. Mayor Rollins. 
Thank you so much, Senator. Uh, and I'm going to start this question with the Chief and Mr. Crawford. Um, we are living in uh, a world that with 24-hour news cycles, um, you know, everyone has access to social media. Information is instant. Um, so and in many cities and communities across the country bump up against um, things like confidentiality and um, policy limitations when they're managing the public response on um, incidents. Um, so how do you manage the, your response to the public? Your, your, how do you manage the trust with the community um, when you have those limitations, when, when you're restricted about what you can say, when, when your policy um, makes it difficult to give all of the information? So we have to be very intentional in Columbia, South Carolina to uh, talk about our processes um, way before an incident happened. It's an ongoing conversation. What happens when we have an officer involved shooting uh, or use of force? The public should already know what the Columbia Police Department does, what our policies say, when we're going to release video, things of that nature, because in the time of uprising is, is not the time to be explaining to the public what we're going to do. It's an ongoing conversation. It's an intentional conversation. And I think the public also has to be involved in that. You know, we have a citizens review board. So not only are they uh, coming into the department evaluating our use of force and policy, but they also are in the community and able to answer questions as to what our policies and procedures and guidelines are. Uh, it's an ongoing conversation. It is a direct conversation, but we also have to be um, willing and able to get out there first and fast um, as, as much as we can. Uh, we, don't have, we don't have unions in South Carolina as a right to work state. So there are certain numbers of things that I can do as a police executive, a certain amount of information that I can release as a police executive um, that I don't have to go through um, some, some things that, other, that they do in other states. But we have to let our public know what we're going to do when an event happens and be intentional about it. Um, and not being afraid to say we, we screwed up. Uh, we, we, we need to do a better job and invite, again, our, our neighbors, our public in to help us make those changes collectively. Uh, again, I think that policing has devolved in the sense of us not being willing to say that we're wrong and to be able to invite those in to help us make those changes. I echo what the chief has just said, transparency, 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 and he's right. It's the wrong time in the middle of, of a serious controversial shooting or use of force uh, action to try to build credibility then. Yeah. You've got to do that continuously. Other point you're starting to see more and more, which I agree with, is media agencies are doing what? Having third party agencies, usually the state agency do what? Take over that investigation and show as much independence uh, of not, of, of the public feeling confident that a third party is going to take, especially that's done with force, take that investigation over, but he's also right about speed and time. People do not want to wait months and months and months. And keep this in mind, most citizens don't know how many agencies there are. So when you see on social media or on TV or something that one agency was able in less than a week to at least give some level of an update and some assurances to the public on what will be the process, and maybe another agency is taking what a month to do that, not that speed is everything, but he's right. You've got to make the community part of that process. And keep this in mind. Use of force policy. That's public information. So it's not like you're hiding anything. The ability to tell the public, what is our policies? Who handles our investigations? What is our use of force steps? And if it's a union part of it, being honest about that. What are the use of union policies and what govern the certain way things are being done? But the part I'm optimistic about is you're starting to see more and more agencies being a lot more upfront and quickly at least telling them what they can tell them. And the last, last thing about this, at the end of the day, the public deserves to know. And you're right, Chief Kelly, if it's bad news, bad news is not getting any better with time. It doesn't get any better with time. And you're right, you're better off being honest. But now I will admit, sometimes complexities of an investigation, and in certain states, there are certain laws that govern how video is being shown. And, and, and it's important about empathy. You have to show respect for the sanctity of life, for the sanctity of life, and making the public understand that our agencies and our minimum that serve in that capacity respect the sanctity just as much as we do as citizens. 
Great. Um, does anyone else want to add to how you can um, build public trust when you're dealing with uh, the, the issues around confidentiality? Otherwise, I will turn it over to the Senator. Thank you, Madam Senator. Mayor. All right. Thank you. Um, Carol, let me answer this question. In terms of the use of deadly force, uh, I mean, help me understand this. Uh, I, every state makes a determination in terms of what their law is concerning the use of deadly force. Is that correct? It's a little more complicated than that. I, th I think that the question is, and this is where community input and community standards and culture are important. Um, th there are laws, which now in New York, for example, um, they've banned chokeholds in certain practices. Some, some other cities, in, as a result of this, are banning certain um, um, techniques. But I think that we've got to get back to the question of how do we educate and prepare law enforcement officers so they're not in a situation where their only option is the choosing between whether to use deadly force or not. No, I, and I understand that. And, um, and I'm, and I might go in that direction. Okay. All right. Well, I'll answer your question then. But, okay, in, but, but, it, but it is, I think that we need to, because when you look at the difficulty of, of making a decision to prosecute law enforcement officers for certain behaviors, it's very difficult because the law is, is, is it's an objective standard, but it's really subjective because it's what would a reasonable officer do in that situation. And so because of that, you know, um, the community, I think, has to be really clear, the political leadership in the community, the, the, the leadership of the police department, about what behavior is and is not acceptable and what you can and can't use in a circumstance. And then that allows you to then say, if there's, if there's behavior that is not in accord with the standards you're setting, to be able to say, okay, this is outside of the bounds of what's acceptable behavior. And that is not where I'm going. That is not where I'm going. Let me tell you where I'm going. Let me tell you where I'm going. Let me tell you where I'm going on this, okay? Where I'm going on this is, um, is that the standard policy, which you just articulated, is that the standard policy in most states in the country? Well, or, as, or is there variation in those policies? Uh, there's yeah. a huge variation because as, as Dwayne said earlier on, we've got 18,000 police departments across the country. Okay, so and, federal, so state, if, local. Mm -hmm. If there's variation in the laws, then you know there's variation in the policies at the exactly. various police departments, right, Dwayne? And it would seem to me, uh, Mr. Cole, that if Ohio has a particular law concerning the use of deadly force, yeah. It would seem to me that all police departments would have a uniform policy within the state of Ohio or whatever state you're in concerning the use of deadly force. Correct Correct me if I'm wrong. Not I'm necessarily. That way. That's one of the challenges right now. There isn't a national standard of use of force. And I'm not even here to say there will ever be an exact one for every agency, but we at Noble do want to see some national standards that become the law of use of force. It won't be the same exact policy. For example, choke codes. Uh, you know, there could be some categories like that. Whereas a nation, we may decide we want to ban choke codes, for example, or vast purpose restraints. But I don't think we're ever going to probably see every agency have the exact same use of force policy. But we can why? definitely, I think, why, why, identify I mean, four or five or maybe again, more. I, mean, I, understand, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. I'll answer your question. I'll answer your question. I think it varies from state to state. For example, in New Jersey, all the law enforcement agencies are under the direction of the attorney general. That is not the case in every state. So, so, the, the, so the ability of anyone to even um, enact a statewide policy varies from state to state and jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And I just let me also just say this: the state attorney generals okay. can play a big role in some of this. I mean by that is we may not be able to get national standards. We'll see how the elections go. But the, you're seeing more and more the state attorney generals beginning to figure out, at least in their states, what that use of force policy may look like. And I think there's some hope in that way. Well, okay. Well, and I know that's a, a longer discussion, but again, from my perspective as a an attorney, a former prosecutor, and also as a senator, it would seem as though that they, we're talking about the taking of life that there should be a uniform policy throughout this country. And that based on that, if we're able to get that done in Congress, that as a condition to receiving monies from the federal government for law enforcement purposes, each state would have we to agree. that particular law. And we agree. Let me just finish, let me finish. And 
each state would have to make certain of their uniform policies within their cities doing the same thing. Because they're taking a life, whether it's in New Jersey, whether it's in New York, or whether it's in Texas, there should be the same uniform policy in place in order to get it done. Mayor Rollins. Thank you so much. So as we think about uh, this, this national policy, a lot of, uh, you know, we can, we can talk about a policy, but then we have to understand that the people on the ground, the, the officers that, that uh, we are uh, putting in uniform and putting in our communities are the ones that are implementing it. And th those are the ones that we need to make sure are the right ones. Uh, to get the policy right. So to that end, I want to uh, ask uh, all the panelists, I'll start with Ms. Mason, you know, what are we doing on an ongoing basis uh, to make sure as we hire new officers, and you, you spoke to this earlier, that we're hiring the right officers, that we're getting the best people possible, and um, that, that we give them the support that they need so they can continue to serve the community in the way that um, provides the, 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 the level of protection and the type of uh, policing that our communities uh, want and, desire and, and deserve. Uh, so what we're trying to do at John Jay, because again, we're educating people going into the profession is to make sure that, that we are making, well, I think that you've got to make the profession attractive to the kind of people that you want in it. And I think that you, what you want is people in the profession who view themselves as partners with the community, willing to listen to the community, work with the community. So you're asking people to come into policing who, are, who, who have empathy, compassion, want to problem solve with the community, want to understand the community, work with the community, and not feel as if they're there to work um, contra to the community. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it stops with recruiting. I think that we've got to recognize that we've also got to figure out how do you change the culture internally as you're making the shift. So you've got generational differences in terms of how officers are prepared and what their understanding of the role is. So as you bring in new officers, Chief Kelly could probably speak to this much better, but, but the, the, the challenge isn't with the leadership. We have found that police chiefs across the country when I was at DOJ and what I'm, my experience of working with John Jay is police chiefs get it. But there's a cultural shift between what, what when you're telling young folks who are coming into the profession what you want, but the people who've been there for generations learning to police differently. And I think the people have the capacity to change. But the question is, how do you, how do you work on that infrastructure and make that change? And, and, and how do you measure, Chief, what it is success looks like? You stop measuring what kind of arrests you make and you start measuring how many positive impact encounters have you had with the community? How well do you know the young people in your community? So those are all, I think, important to changing the culture of policing, the understanding of what their role is. I'll go to Mr. Crawford or the chief. She's exactly right. We have to change the way we even rewarded officers where we used to reward all these acts of valor and heroism. Um, that's good too, but we reward officers for saving a life, for being able to de-escalate a harmful situation. I think the paradigm shift that needs to take place is, is not militaristic as much as it, it should be community driven and how we uh, sh shift the thought process of our officers. The other part of that is, is to hire slow and to fire quick. Uh, while you may come into an agency doing all of the right things, there tends to be a shift that takes place to some of, some of the officers while employed. And they tend to sometimes do things that we don't need to, them to do, but you have to be upfront in helping officers out of the agency. I call it helping them out. You have to get rid of those who cause problems that go against the, the, you know, the core values of your agency and being direct about it and, and make them the shining example of what not to do. Uh, so other officers know that they can, uh, they can suffer the same fate if they don't you know, fall in line. And just being bold enough to say that it's not easy to, to fire officers, but coming to the job, the young professionals should know that they wear the history that comes with the uniform that they put on. And that history isn't always kind to people of color. It's not always kind. Um, Anthony talked about slave patrols, and we talk about the war on drugs. We talk about Jim Crow. The drum majors of that were law enforcement. And we have to be bold enough to say, we're getting away from that type of service. And uh, that's, you're not needed in the line if, if those are the things that you want to engage in. 
And, and you need to ask the community, their communities where it's done successfully, where they've asked the community, what qualities do you want in the law enforcement officers in your community? Mm -hmm. Oh, get definitely. them engaged in the process and then deliver on what they've asked for what they need. Definitely. I will. I know that we're running out of time, so I'm going to turn it back over to the senator. I want to ask just one more question. And, and Mayor Tubbs, uh, given that you're a mayor, uh, Stockton uses uh, body cameras. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, how impactful has the use of that type of technology impacted um, police behavior and citizen behavior? Yeah, no, um, it's interesting because body cameras seem to be the first thing um, a lot of folks want to go to, but I think the research is still a little bit mixed as, as to its, its effectiveness. And we do know for sure that body cameras aren't a panacea for everything, but they're a powerful tool for transparency, provided there's policies in place to hold folks accountable if the body camera shows something that's negative, right? Because oftentimes, if there's just a body camera, we'll see the atrocities are happening, but if there's no mechanism to hold folks accountable for what we're seeing, then we're just watching trauma replayed and replayed. So I think we started body cameras in 2014, but we also started body cameras at the same time we started to work with Carol and National Trust. We started the reconciliation work. We started the policy change work. So the body cameras are a part of our overall strategy for sure. And, um, have they have they, have you seen a reduction in the number of police complaints against police officers as a result of uh, the mix of tools that you're using right now? I have to check on that, but honestly, Senator, I'm not. I guess I'm not convinced that a decline in officer and, and complaints against officers is the right metric, and that we know that often there's a lot of reasons why people don't go and report or, or, or complain, that doesn't necessarily mean we're doing a better job. Um, so, I, so I do think we look at that matrix, but we also look at sort of use of force incidents in total, like how often are we using force, whether people complain or not, and kind of use that. And we've seen those, those that, that metric continue to decline as our officers are getting more and more trained in de-escalation and other tools at their disposal to um, combat crime or to engage with constituents. Mr. Cole, how would you respond to that question? Um, I guess uh, I look at it uh, very similarly as far as execution. I guess I would answer it more um, aspirationally from the sense of what, you know, what, what does success look like if, if we do the right things and, and so we continue to try, try and work towards it. Um, and it's a lot of what uh, other folks uh, today has, have said. Um, so I look at it from the community's perspective where um, I think, uh, and an administrator's perspective, obviously, um, you have all the policies in the world um, and, you know, we have an expectation that people follow them, of course, but when someone doesn't, you know, there's consequences in every other uh, line of work. And I think that's what the citizens really ultimately want is that um, something does happen that's not supposed to happen and someone's held accountable for it. And, and, it, and it happens in, in a, you know, timely. And, and so when you start looking at the reactions that, is, that are going on a, a, across the country, it's a, it's a frustration that there's not accountability there. And so, you know, really, I think the work that we're talking about is, you know, how do you really truly hold um, folks accountable? We have these uh, checks and balances in place, but it really is a hot potato. You can do everything that you want to do um at your city level but it may be the union contract you can do everything you want to be able to do at the city level but then it might be the county prosecutor uh is going to kick it to a grand jury and, and everything that you're seeing in, in kentucky right now um and what folks really want to 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 to, to have is a, is it is faith people do give municipalities a chance every time they they give a municipality a chance and they have an unwritten timeline. And in that timeline, there should be a decision that is made. And it should be equal to the, the egregious activity, whether it is police brutality, whether it is um, you know, a, a corrupt activity, planting evidence, whatever the case may be, once it's discovered, there's an action. So 
you know, we are talking about the differences in every municipality. We're talking about different union contracts, whether in, in our case in Ohio, as you brought up, Senator, we have a thing called home rule. So it doesn't really allow for this, uh, you know, statewide, you know, just the laws that are currently in place. But at the end of the day, all politics are local, right? Everything it is how is it implemented locally. And locally, what everyone wants to see is, are you getting better at responding to when there is a violation of policy? When someone is hurt and injured, is there, is there accountability? Could it be avoided? Because at the end of the day, I think the public also does understand that officers are in the line of fire. There are dangerous situations. And there are situations where a weapon does have to get discharged. The one question is, was that the only way that this could have been handled? And if it could have been handled another way, you're going to be held accountable for that. So, you know, with that as the litmus test, that's where all of our work kind of, you know, kind of goes. So anyway, that's, uh, I'll shut up. <laughs> okay. I'm going to turn it back over, Mayor. I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Ms. Connor uh, to kind of close us out. Thank you. Well, first of all, I'd like to say thank you to our panelists. I think we've had a pretty uh, vigorous conversation. Um, we see some agreement across the, across the um, different um, disciplines here. And um, I do want to, we did plan to, that we could leave, roll over just a little bit. I've seen a couple questions, I think, in the chat box that we might want to look at if we see if something we haven't answered. Um, most of them, I think, agree that um, we need to have accountability. Um, I think someone, it resonated with someone, the issue of uh, militaristic type training. So I think that was something that um, they agreed with that needed to be looked at. I don't see any, I think, questions, I believe, here. So what I'd say is I think that you've done such an outstanding job answering questions, clarified some things for um, our members, but we want to continue this dialogue. I want to say thank you to all of you. Um, I think that many have heard some very innovative things um, related to uh, Stockton. I think that everybody will be calling you trying to figure out what it is you're doing. Um, Chief Kelly, sounds like Columbia, South Carolina, is um, also making some changes and being sort of the policing, police department most people would want them to have. Um, Carol, we are really can't wait for the outcomes uh, for you and Noble, uh, the uh, hearings that you've been hearing and the results of that and uh, the models that you may be uh, recommending. And all of us are looking forward to what happens at the federal level, whether it's funding, it's new initiatives, and support of some of these, um, the CBC, I think all of our organizations, African-American mayors, have gotten together to um, set out principles and guidelines of what they'd like to see in future policing. Uh, Noble, NFBPA, and African-American Mayors Association hope to get together in about a month. So we believe if you got the elected officials, the appointed officials, and you have the implementers as the police, that we should be able to solve this problem and not wait for another incident to happen. So I want to say thank you. Thank you to our moderators for doing such an excellent job of teasing the information out of everyone, and we appreciate you. And to the members of NFBPA and those on Facebook, thank you for um, joining us, and I think we have a lot to talk about and some tools that we can move forward with. So thank you very much. Thanks, folks.